I think we can start. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm here today to speak about uh, large language models, but not like just how you use them, but how do you actually train them? And more specifically, how do you train them in some smaller, less known language with limited data? and how to fine tune them for some specific tasks. So a little bit about me, uh, I'm Nemanja. I'm currently working as a tech lead at a company called Budinsoft. I'm mostly focused uh, on a backend, but I've started doing some AI stuff uh, during my masters. Uh, as it says, I'm programming mostly in Java and Go, uh, and for this AI stuff, I use Python, and today's code examples are actually going to be shown in Python. Uh, I'm also one of the co-founders of uh, our local Java user group in Niche in Serbia. We organize meetups, so if you're ever in Niche, uh, come by and check us out. So the company where I work, uh, called Badinsoft, we are mostly outsourced company, but we have some of our products. Uh, we are mostly doing fintech uh, broadcasting telecommunications for BlackRock, United Group, Raiffeisen Bank, and other companies. I'm not going to talk that much uh, about this. You can find all the information if you want on the website, or you can speak with me uh, after the talk. What I'm actually going to talk about today is something called uh, Cerberta, a bit difficult to, to pronounce, uh, but it's actually a large language model based on BERT model. Uh, and it's a large language model pre-trained and fine-tuned in Serbian language. It was actually a research project at the uh, University of Niš. Uh, and it was at Faculty of Electronic Engineering. Uh, it was developed by me, uh, by Professor Miloš Bogdanović and my colleague Jelena Tošić. Uh, and it's available uh, with Clarin license, which means it's free and uh, it's free for uh, research, it's free for commercial use, uh, you can just take it and develop something uh, with it. So, how do you actually create a model uh, like uh, this one? But before that, why do you want to create a model like this one? Why do you actually need a models uh, like uh, this one? Well, most models uh, support English, basically all of them support English. Some of them support other Bing languages, like French, Spanish, German. Uh, but it's really important to provide models uh, which support some smaller languages. So there is an equal opportunity for the AI usage. It's great that we have all of these models, like GPT, like uh, Lama from Facebook. Uh, but if they don't support a lot of languages, a lot of people can't actually use them. GPT actually supports Serbian, but for example, Lama does not. Uh, and also, why do you fine-tune them? Uh, well, fine-tuned AI models uh, can ensure that uh, they can precisely understand some specific uh, domain. Uh, in our case, we fine-tune it for legal text, so it really understands the legal domain. Uh, and models like that one for the legal domain can reduce costs, can expedite legal research, document review, can analyze contracts, can even help lawyers to create a new contracts or to fix some contracts that are not written uh, as they are supposed to be. Uh, and also it can help not just lawyers but other organizations uh, to like basically uh, minimize uh, risks uh, and potential penalties uh, while uh, tracking all the regulations and everything that's happening in the low domain. Uh, so what do we actually need to create a model like this one? Uh, so we need the pre-training data and we need a lot of pre-training data. Uh, we need a tokenizer, we need an optimizer, uh, we need most importantly a model on which we will base our own model. And we, for fine-tuning, we, of course, need fine-tuning data. But before we go to training, uh, I'm going to do just a little bit of introduction, a little bit of history. I'm not going to talk uh, much about, uh, about that. I'm going to focus mostly on training. Uh, natural language processing uh, is what we're going to talk about today. That's a nice uh, connection between computer science and linguistics. Uh, and that's actually the natural language processing. It is bound together by machine learning. Uh, it 
it has a huge expansion in the last 10 years. And why did it get a huge expansion in the last 10 years? Well, actually, about 10 years ago, something called Transformers uh, was invented, but not these Transformers. Actually, these Transformers, Transformer architecture. Uh, and since then, uh, large language models really got a huge uh, explosion in popularity. Uh, what is a transformer architecture? That is a neural net architecture for natural language processing, but it can also be used for other sequential tasks, but it, like 90% of its usage is for uh, natural language processing. It relies on a self-attention mecha mechanism uh, and it has basically two components. You have an encoder, which processes some input and can extract features using self-attention. And you have a decoder that can generate output sequences also using self-attention. And you basically get a bunch of encoders and decoders and you stack them together. And you create uh, some model based on Transformers architecture. Uh, what does it mean, self-attention mechanism? Well, it basically understands context very well. Uh, it looks uh, not just at some specific word, but it takes uh, that word and looks that word in a context of the whole sentence. Uh, so transformer architecture is a backbone for many state-of-the-art uh, models of the day, uh, like GPT, like Lama, BERT, which we're going to talk about today. Basically, all large language models today use uh, this architecture in the background. So how do you actually choose a model uh, for your model that you want to create? Well, first you take a look at what are you going to do with that model, your, your potential usage. And when we started our research, we said, OK, we want to create a model. Uh, and we imagine that that model will be used in a, some tool similar to, let's say, Grammarly. You basically, like on the, this image, you select some word. And you expect from the software to give you alternative words or correct words or just fix that word, just like Grammarly does. In Grammarly, you can select some word and you can get a bunch of other words that you can use instead of that one. Uh, and we said, OK, that's the potential usage of the model. And uh, since you're selecting the word and focusing on that specific word, we said, OK, what does this look like a job for? Which model does exactly this? And the answer was not a model, but a technique called masked language modeling. Uh, and masked language modeling does exactly that. It takes a word, it masks that word, and then uh, it looks at the whole sentence before and after that word and tries to guess that word. So basically, uh, that's the exact usage that we imagined for, uh, for our model, like, for example, in a tool like a Grammarly. And since we wanted to do mask language modeling, we said, OK, we're going to use BERT model, or bidirectional encoder representation from transformers, which is a model that is developed by Google in 2018, so very recently, but in AI that's <laughs> like a decade ago. Uh, and it's based on a transformers architecture, of course. It uses a bidirectional encoding, which means exactly that what I said earlier. It takes a look at both uh, the text before some word and after some word, not just after the word. Uh, and yeah, it can understand context before and after. And it comes in a two sizes. Uh, it comes in a base and in large uh, size. Uh, here on the image, you can see the difference between those. So basically, the base or the small one has 110 million parameters, and it has 12 transformer layers. And the large one has 340 million parameters and 24 transformer layers. But we, we didn't actually use BERT model. We used Roberta, which is an improved version of the of BERT model. It was developed by Facebook. It was pre-trained on a lot more data. Uh, and it uses more masked tokens, so it can actually better understand the context. It also comes in two sizes with 12 and 24 layers and 125 and 355 million uh, parameters. So the tools that uh, you use, that we used actually, uh, when developing a model like this, uh, we used Python, we used PyTorch, and we use a Hugging Face library. 
And of course, all of that was running on a GPU, so we used uh, NVIDIA CUDA library. Okay, so first step with training is actually pre-training. Uh, pre-training is actually training a model on a l large and diverse data set, and the goal is to teach the model to understand the, the language, to understand various linguistic patterns. Uh, and plus, in our case, since we are using mask language modeling, the goal was to train the model to predict some word that we mask. Uh, generally, uh, pre-training is extremely important since fine-tuning directly depends on pre-training. Uh, and the, the main goal is to teach the model like general knowledge about that language. And it requires a lot of data. Uh, the more, the better, but also the quality is really important, but the quantity is also uh, really, really important. And the data that we used for this is OSCAR dataset, uh, in Serbian language specifically. It contains 7.7 .7 gigabytes of data and 632 million words. Maybe there is some newer version. I'm not sure since we did this about six months ago, this was the newest version then. And Oscar dataset is basically data scraped from the web. So uh, blog posts, news articles, basically everything that you can find on the web in Serbian language. When you take the data, you have to actually create a data set uh, and uh, you have to divide the data. So first you need the training data and testing data. Training data is something that actually goes to the model and testing data is something that is not gonna be visible to the model like ever. So you put the testing data on the, uh, on the side and you take the training data and split it additionally to training and validation uh, and you pass that data to the model. How do you actually do this? Yeah, I think it's visible. So here we can see that uh, we are using the datasets uh, library. This is from Hugging Face. You need a token to, to access uh, datasets on Oscar. Uh, and then we configure, uh, okay, we say we want Oscar Corpus uh, 2301. That was the newest at that uh, time. We want to cache it because it's 7.7 .7 gigabytes. We don't want to pull it every time we need it. Uh, and we want to, we want that data in a Serbian language. And we don't want to stream it, just, uh, okay, just, just download everything, uh, don't, don't stream it. Uh, after that, we did something with, the, with that data. Uh, we split the data in files, uh, which were all the same size. Uh, and of course, since there is some data left at the end, uh, we put that data at the last uh, in the last file, uh, and one, once we have all the data, we have to create uh, tokenizer. Uh, tokenization is basically a process where you break down uh, text or sequences in a smaller units, uh, and they're called tokens. Uh, so you have some text, you do a tokenization, you get a list of tokens. Uh, for example, we have a sentence, I love ice cream, and at the end, if you do a word, to a word tokenization, you will get an array with uh, I love ice cream. Uh, tokens don't have to be words, they can be subwords uh, or even characters. So to tokenization, basically tokenizer needs to be trained, because tokenizer is also some small model. But you don't have to train it on all, the, all, on all of the data. You can train it just on part of the data. We trained our tokenizer on about 60% uh, of the data. Uh, and we used byte level tokenizer in our project. Uh, that training is really fast. It took us about uh, half an hour to get the tokenizer trained. And uh, the code for that is pretty simple. Uh, we import the transformers library. And from Transformers Library, we actually use uh, Roberta tokenizer, since, as I said, we are leveraging Facebook's Roberta model. Uh, and then we create uh, byte-level BP tokenizer, and we train that tokenizer. You have to provide the file paths to them, and you have to define vocabulary size, which here is 50,265, which may seem random, but it is not. Uh, that's the vocabulary size that Roberta's, the small Roberta model, the base model uh, uses, so we are using it also. 
Uh, and yeah, we are using the small Roberta model because we were really limited with resources uh, during this research. Uh, and we only have one GPU and like basically one machine to train this, so we couldn't use larger model. Uh, and then we say, okay, uh, tokenize all the words with minimum frequency too. So we don't want to ever tokenize, uh, we don't want to take a word that, ha that showed only once in the whole uh, corpus. And we define some special tokens for this. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but mask is really important one that represents that word that we are trying to guess. Uh, and after that, we start the training, and once the model is trained, we save, the, we save it in some file we called our Serberta tokenizer. Uh, after that, you have to prepare tensors, which has actually two steps. First one is mask language modeling, uh, which takes uh, a random tensor, with, which has the same size as the one you input there, and it creates uh, a mask here it says with probabilities less than 0.15, which actually means that 15, maximum 15% of the uh, tokens will be masked with that mask that needs to be uh, guessed. And you also exclude some special tokens. Here's the code for that. We have a PyTorch library important, imported. We also use Transformers library. And here's the function that actually takes uh, and masks 15% 15 15 of, the, of the token. So basically, uh, you pass it a tensor, which is actually representation vector representation of some uh, text sequence, and it masks some parts of, this, of that, of that uh, sequence randomly. So AI model can be trained to guess those masked words. The next step in preparing tensors is to actually prepare them. And we need three uh, lists of tensors. We need input IDs, masks, and labels. Input IDs are going to store all the input tokens. Uh, masks are going to store the attention masks for each sample. And labels will store the labels for each uh, sample. Uh, tokenization is done for every line in each file. We had about 80 files when we divided those 7.7 .7 gigabytes of data. Uh, and we basically go through each line, do that's this function for before for each line. And at the end, we have all the tensors ready. And here's the code, code for that. So as I said, we prepare three empty arrays. Then we go through all the lines and do mask language modeling on them, and then append that to the arrays. And we have the uh, tensor arrays ready to pass to the model for pre-training. Uh, for pre-training, you have to load the data. Uh, from those saved files. Uh, and to do that, we, you have to store them in some dictionary. We call that dictionary encodings. Uh, you basically define custom PyTorch data set. We, you initialize it with data. And what's important is to set uh, batch size and shuffle flag. Shuffle flag is true in our case. And uh, batch size is, uh, I think, 8. Uh, we're going to look at that in, uh, in code. So we load the tensors we created before. We save them to disk, and now we load them. Uh, we create that dictionary, and we create a data set which actually has a couple of functions. It has a constructor which accepts the dictionary, and it has a function for length and to, to, to return a specific item. We just goes through, through, through the dictionary and does that. And uh, yeah, batch size is actually 16, not 8, sorry. Uh, why 16? Well, you basically put batch size the larger, the faster your training is going to go. It's not really, it's not going to impact uh, accuracy at the end, but it's going to impact speed. Uh, 16 is really low number. As I said, we were li really limited with uh, hardware. Uh, we only had one NVIDIA Quadro 5000 GPU. Uh, so the maximum batch size was 16 in our case. Uh, for example, Facebook, uh, when they trained Roberta, they actually used batch size 8,000 <laughs> and ours 16. So it really took us a lot of time to train. And how do you train it? Well, you basically start iterating through epochs. You iterate then through each batch in each epoch. You compute gradients of the loss and you update the model parameters. And 
code for this is like this. So you need uh, a bunch of stuff from Transformers library, Roberta config, Roberta tokenizer, and Roberta for mask language modeling. And uh, you need optimizer. Uh, we used Adam V optimizer because it actually doesn't have a constant learning rate. It actually adapts learning rate uh, while you train. It changes it. And this is the configuration for our model. Uh, here you can see that we are setting the vocabulary size the same as in tokenizer. We set maximum position embeddings to 514. Uh, why 514? Well, Roberta can uh, recognize 512 different embeddings, uh, positions for embeddings, plus it has a two specific uh, tokens for the start of the sequence and the end of the sequence. So 512 plus 2 uh, is 514. Uh, then we have hidden size 768, which is a default in Roberta, so we used it also. And we have uh, attention heads and hidden layers set to 12. Uh, that's basically compromise with our hardware resources. We couldn't use uh, uh, some other numbers, like larger numbers. So this was the maximum that we could do with our hardware resources. And vocabulary size is set to one. Roberta uses two by default, but we did some experimentation and uh, we get a better result with uh, one. Uh, so now you uh, create that model with that configuration. Uh, you empty cache in your graphics card uh, and you basically say, okay, give me the device where I'm gonna train this. Uh, we are requesting the CUDA, which is GPU, but if it's not available, we're using CPU. Uh, don't train on CPU, <laughs> it's too slow. Uh, and then you set that uh, model to that device and you start, uh, and you set it okay, prepare that model for training. You can also prepare it for validation. But for this step, we need to pre be prepared for training. And then uh, we create an optimizer. Uh, we set the initial learning rate. Uh, that learning rate is gonna change uh, during training automatically. And we say, okay, uh, with all this ready, let's set the number of epochs that we want to train. Uh, you you want to train uh, the more the better, but you don't want to train too much so it, you get to the overfitting. Uh, Epoch 25 is from our last run, we actually trained this model multiple times. Uh, the final model was trained in 25 uh, epochs. Uh, and then, yeah, you start going through each epoch and through, through each batch. Uh, and as I said, you... Uh, load the, the tensors and you basically calculate uh, loss, compute gradients and update the parameters. There is also some stuff here for uh, tensor board so we can track uh, everything uh, while, it's, uh, while it's training. Okay, at the end we actually saved our model after every epoch because this was actually a research project and we wanted to show how number of epochs affects the model, so we want to compare model from every epoch. So we saved model after each epoch. Of course, we also saved at the end the final, the final model. Uh, this is the loss function during those 25 epochs. Uh, you can see that at the beginning model really learned uh, a lot, but uh, basically after the epoch 20 to 25, there was not much uh, uh, learning, so we could really stop the training after about 20 epochs, but we let it go to 25. So after that, uh, you have to fine-tune the model, and fine-tuning basically takes the pre-trained model, which al already knows uh, language and understands general language, and it adapts it so it can understand the, some special stuff for, in our case, legal language and legal concepts. These uh, fine-tuned models uh, can achieve, achieve really high precision and high accuracy uh, in tasks like contract analysis uh, or some legal information retrieval, which is actually something I'm going to talk about later, which is our next step uh, for this model, for research. Uh, and they can be used for the tools uh, for contract review, legal research, compliance analysis, and so on. So data for fine-tuning. I don't expect you to understand this, uh, this logo, it's in Cyrillic, but uh, data is basically collected for legal, from legal information system of Republic of Serbia. 
uh, it contains uh, constitution, it contains statutes and other legal documents. Uh, this is not just scraped data. We didn't just, okay, we created some bot to scrape the data. This is actually manually collected data and it's actually high quality data, which is also published uh, with the model with Clarion license. Because uh, some data, some statues really had some uh, tables in them or just images or they contain just two lines and model can't really learn anything from that. So we manually selected only the data that model can learn from. And the process for fine tuning was basically, okay, start with the best pre-trained model because the better pre-trained model is the better fine tuned model will be. You use the same tokenizer as for pre-training and you prepare and load tensors in the same way. So we're not gonna go through that again. And the most important stuff is watch for the over for overfitting. So you don't have to fine tune it in the same number of epochs as you uh, pre-train the model. You're gonna go to the overfitting. Uh, so here the distinction between fine tuning and uh, uh, sorry, pre-training uh, is that we do not start with the empty model. We don't set the configuration here. We basically load the pre-trained model and we just continue training that model. So no configuration. We also set the different learning rate for the Adam V optimizer. And here uh, the loop for the fine tuning is basically the same as uh, as for pre-training. So nothing uh, nothing special here. Just go through everything, calculate gradients, and uh, op save uh, save the, the model at, at the end. Uh, this is the loss function for fine tuning. Uh, so as we see, the loss function at the end of pre-training was pretty flat, but here we can see that the model on the new data really continued to learn. And the fine tuning is done actually in five epochs instead of 25. And since it has really not that much data, uh, as for fine tuning, it took really short amount of time. F just for fun, like our uh, pre-training took about 13 days for that 25 epochs on our underpowered uh, machine. This is the accuracy that we got at the end. So for pre-trained model, 77% and for fine tuned, 83 which may not seem like much, but since the language that we trained it at is a small language, it's really limited with the data. And uh, we also had limited uh, uh, resources for training. Uh, this is really good result. Uh, but for the next steps, uh, we are trying actually to get access for a better hardware. Uh, there is some uh, government uh, facility which has NVIDIA 100 GPUs, a cluster of them, and we want to train our model actually on those GPUs and on more data. So with that, we expect to get the accuracy over 95%, which will be amazing, and then this model can really be used in some commercial, uh, commercial applications. Also, uh, parallel with that, we are actually finishing a research uh, about how to use this model for semantic search in legal documents. F for example, you could uh, just search for anything legally and it, it should go through all, all the legal documents you have and find uh, everything semantically. Okay, so yeah, that's it from me. Uh, from me, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now or later. If you wanna connect, just scan the, the QR code. Thanks.